The Reality of the Gospel World Outreach Ministries presents the Voice of Deliverance broadcast, featuring the explosive preaching, bold teaching, and the powerful prayer of deliverance of Heaven's Ambassador, Leonard Ford. Brother Ford is a minister that does what others don't, and he has a ministry that goes where others won't. He and his wife, Jesse travel across America and around the world, preaching hope and bringing deliverance. Whether they are in the church, under the gospel tent, or on the mission field, they boldly declare that if you continue in the word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now I present to you, Brother Ford. So I want to carry you into a service where my pastor, Dr. Scott Stewart, is ministering a powerful Holding a timely word that I'll make. Matter of fact, it's so good. I'm going to share it with you this week and next week because you need to get the whole thing. God bless you. Hear ye him. And remember this. Jesus will pull you through if you can stand the pull. God bless I you. I began to get a revelation that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And God grabbed a hold of me, sent my wife and I to the mission field. And to this day, my wife and I speak six languages fluently between the two of us. So I could, I could change languages right now and preach to you. Not because of me, but because of him, right? And so, and as long as I keep that in perspective, then guess what? He's going to give me a seventh language and an eighth language. Why do I have to stop at six? Why can't we just keep on pushing out there? If, if, if I stay in that revelation, that root of knowing that everything I have and everything I do is not by, by the might of my hand, by the brilliance of my brain, but by God and his power. It's not by might or by power, but it's what? It's by my spirit, says the Lord. So when I understand that and I live from the inside out, the revelation I have about this issue or that issue or the other issue becomes a manifested reality because my revelation moves reality. My revelation causes things to happen, and it should be an effortless thing. Because somebody very famous once said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is and my burden is. Okay, so let's not make it hard, okay? This is a very simple faith. We believe. And he answers. We knock and he opens. We pray and he responds. That's how simple he made this for us. And so now there are all, I mean, we could spend years and years teaching all the principles of God's word. And so, but at the end of the day, it all comes back down to this is getting our heart in a place where God's word can become revelation in our life and can change how we live. It can change how I believe. It changes what I do. And it puts me in a place where things just begin to happen. And just a quick testimony here. Um, whenever my wife and I, the Lord sent us to several churches, and, and God bless us, we started many, many churches in different countries. And after a while, I got to the point to where I knew that if I could just go to the place that God told me to go, if I just got in the city, all, all of a sudden, things would just start happening. I would be praying. I'd go to a city and I would just pray. And I knew that I just had to go about my life and things would start happening. And so just as a quick example, I'll tell you a quick quick story, one one testimony out of out of many. I was I had begun to feel that God was moving, he wanted me to move from Sweden to Finland to plant another church. And so Usually when he deals with me with things like that, normally it's about six months ahead of time before I actually do anything. So it gives me half a year to pray into it and speak into it and declare into it. And I encourage you to do that. I take, typically, I'll do this almost on a daily basis, but I will talk out my future. I'll just get before God and I'll start, I'll reach deep, grab a hold of that revelation that's not made its way into reality yet, and I'll start speaking out the future. Start talking out what I don't see. Let God begin, begin to see through my eyes. Let me begin to see through his eyes, rather, and speak from, from, the, from the Spirit. So, I, in the midst of all this, surprise, surprise, I get a telephone, I get a telephone call inviting me to come and preach in a Bible school in Helsinki. That's the capital of Finland. Shouldn't surprise me. I've been praying about it for six months. So I go to this, this place. Well, in the midst of me praying about all this, the Lord begins to drop in my heart a, a, a city in, in Finland called Juveskula. And that's about in the middle of the country, about three and a half uh, hours north. Everybody say Uvescula? Okay. <laughs> about middle of the country. And so, 
So I'm at the, this Bible school, and I'm teaching. I'm having a good time. It was so good, I was buying my own CDs, okay? That's how good it was. So I'm just, we're just having a good time, enjoying the Lord. And, and right after service, this man comes up to me, and he says, Hey, listen, you said you're, in, in my sermon, I mentioned I was going to go to Uveshkula. And he said, you said you're going to go to Uveshkula, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, here, when you get there, call this telephone number. So, again, I'm just going to show up. And God is going to do something. Why? Because things are brought to me because I'm living from revelation. I'm, I'm keeping myself rooted, knowing that wherever I go and whatever I do, it's not because I'm there because I wanted to go, but God is the one who put me here, and God is going to cause things to happen. So I get to you, with my whole family. I call this number, having no idea what it was about. I call this number, and I introduce myself. And the lady said, yes, yeah, someone called us from Helsinki and told us you were coming up here. Can we meet you? She gives me an address. So I said, sure. So I go to this address, and I meet her, and I'm met, not just by her, but by a group of people. And they said, hello, pastor. We've been waiting for you, and here are the keys to the building. I said, what? Uh -huh. and, and they said, yes. So what happened is this group of people have been praying, believing, and asking God to start a church in this city. They were praying, and they were so specific. They said, God, we want this church. We want this church. So they went out as an act of faith and already rented a whole building, filled it full of chairs, pulpit, piano. My office was already completely taken care of. The children were all fully equipped. A fully equipped church with nothing happening. And they were praying and calling on God to send the man of God. And then they said, Lord, send us an American to do it. And when I got there, they dropped the keys in my hand and said, let's go. And I thought, you know what? And, as, and it happened every time I went to a new country, I just knew if I could get there, the revelations on the inside of me would just start making things happen. Do you know how many years I would have to work to make that happen in the natural? Just to get people to want to follow you takes, you got to gain try. I mean, come on, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Just, that, that's, that, that's some effort I'm putting out there. But it should be a lot easier than what we make it because, I mean, God has been very simple with us. He says things like, lay your hands upon the sick and they shall recover. He doesn't say lay your hands on the sick and pray a theologically sound prayer with 14 points, a poem, and three songs. He, he, just, he says, lay your hands on the sick and they recover. He didn't even say you have to quote a verse of scripture. Just How, how simple is that? You want to be born again? Here's a simple thing you do. You believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. He doesn't say, okay, believe with your heart, confess with your mouth, and then go on a fast for three weeks and then go and, you know, he didn't give us all. It's a very simple thing. And then to understand that fruit has a root is also a very simple thing. So we want the fruit because the fruit is what we eat and live off of. But there's only fruit as long as the root is in place is the root is, is stayed healthy. And that root is always going to be grounded in God. And that grounding in God is based upon revelation that we have from His Spirit and from His Word. And here He tells us, He said, listen, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to encourage you. Listen, God brought the blessing to them. He gave them houses. Remember when they went into the promised land? Remember what happened? They said, I'm going to give you houses you didn't build. I'm going to give you vineyards that you didn't plant. I'm going to give you wells you didn't dig. That sounds like a pretty easy deal. I, I built a house. I moved to Little Rock. I built a house. <laughs> it, it, yeah, yeah. That is, that's a big deal. Especially when the wife says, do you like this color or this color? <laughs> and gentlemen, you know what I'm talking about? It's the same color. There's no difference in those two shades. But she sees there's a difference there. And then, and this, then gentlemen, this is what we do. We say, I like that one. Oh, I'll take this one. I mean, just the opposite. Like whatever I choose, it's going to be the opposite of that. Because I chose wrongly. You know, it's just, it's just the way it works. I should be used to this by now. But, but, the, but, the, but the point is, it takes, it takes effort to build a house. God said, I'm going to give you houses you didn't build. And guess, you're not even going to have to buy them. I'm just going to give you the house. And you don't have to dig a well. How many know it's hard to dig a well? Especially back in those days, when you're in Israel, it's full of rocks. You've got a spade in your hand. You don't, have a, you don't have a backhoe. And he said, I'm going to give you wells you didn't dig and give you vineyards you didn't plant. Listen, I grew up. In it, my, my mom and dad loved having a garden. I hated having a garden because guess who the weeder was? I was the weed boy. I'm the one who was pulling the weed. You know how it is in Arkansas? There's as much heat coming from the ground as there is coming from the sun. It was bad. Then I had this wonderful experience one day. We went to Florida. We came home. 
and the two cows that my dad had bought because he just wanted to have two cows had gotten into the garden and eaten everything, which meant I was free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty. I, was, I didn't have to do any more wheat all summer long. Come on, somebody talk to me in the house of that. I was loving those cows, loving those cows, eating it all, done. My dad was livid, and I was happy. I was so happy. Now, I'm sure God didn't do that, but I was glad the cows did. Okay. But my point is this. So I, I began to know I can just go to a country that God sends me to, that is. Something's going to happen. We want one more really quick one before I, I get back into the into the text here. I was in living in in um, in Finland, and I knew that I was headed to Norway, and and uh, so when I was praying about it and praying about it, and I got an invitation to go and speak at a at a conference in Sweden. So I went back to my old stomping ground in Sweden, and I was preaching at this conference, and I get this note. This note said, "I would like to have breakfast with you in the morning," and that the person signed their name, and lo and behold, it was a Norwegian name. Okay, great. So I go in to have breakfast, sit down, and the pastor says, listen, I was prophesied before I came over here that I was going to meet somebody here that was going to be very important to our ministry in Norway. And when you walked in the room, God said, you're the man. And he said, so what's on your heart? And I said, well, I have a heart to come to Norway and to plant two churches. He said, well, let me tell you what we already got planned. He said, when you come to Norway, he said, you let me know, and I'm going to take care of things. Well, I didn't know what all that meant until the day God said, call the man. You're going to Norway. So I picked up the phone. I called him. He said, I'm so glad you called. He said, because listen, we already have offices for you and your, your, your staff. He said, we already have rooms for your kids to have their homeschooling. He said, every telephone call you make, every fax you send, back, there, back in those days it was faxes, you know what I'm saying. He said, every piece, everything you copy, I'm paying for everything. I've been training 12 men for uh, four or five years, and you just pick the one you want to be your associate, and you can take them and go and do whatever God wants you to do. I have prayers and worship teams that will follow you around and do whatever it is that you, that you need to do. You come and do what God told you to do, and I'll just pay for all the bills. You know how long it would take me to work that out in the natural if I try to do that? Trying try to get someone to give an offering is, is tough, but can you imagine trying to get somebody? Can you imagine? Can you imagine trying to get somebody to pay for everything? You're going to plant two churches and just pay for everything and give you staff on top of that and give you buildings and give you all that stuff? And listen, that type of stuff can only happen because you're, you're walking in a revelation that just makes things happen. Your revelation will move reality. And to that, this is why you got to spend a lot more time sowing in here than you focus on what happens out here. Because what happens out here will automatically happen because you're making sure that the revelation you're living in is you're sowing into it, you're incubating it, you're confessing it, you're meditating. And I'll just go ahead and say this, and I'm not even going to get into this very much, but one thing that we don't do very well, and I haven't really taught my church much about this, but what we don't do really well in the body of Messiah, and that is we don't know how to meditate. We know how to pray and how to confess, but how do you meditate? Meditation's got a bad, you know, hum, bum, hum, there, you know, bad reputation. But how do you biblically meditate? Because, see, you're supposed to meditate and then you have good success. There's something about incubating and meditation. My wife came to me the other day. I was, I was uh, working on some, uh, some sermons and she said, What are you doing? And I said, I'm meditating. Because meditation looks very different. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I wasn't planning on talking about that, but but meditation is an important thing. I don't want you to go off and Google anything about meditation, okay? Don't do it, because you're going to wind up in Weirdsville, okay? You just wait, wait for a man of God to teach you about, about how to meditate. But that's that's a point that we, and we, we ha we're happy to quote that Joshua meditated on the Word, and we see, we say, well, the word here in Hebrew actually means to mutter. It means so much more than that. But we just think mutter means to confess. No, confess means to confess. Mutter is something different because it deals a lot more than just saying it. So, But there's a something that happens when we begin to meditate on the Word of God. Again, it goes back into this whole rooted thing. So everything we do is because of Him and for Him and through Him. And all that we have is because of Him. All the strength that we have is through Him. In other words... Again, without him, we can't do anything. So as long as we're finding a way to live in the balance of that, and he gets glory and credit for all that we do, then we find ourselves being safe in God. So here we see that he mentions here that if we're not careful, what will happen is God said, I'm going to bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. But if you don't remember where you're getting this from, then you're going to get messed up. you got to remember where it comes from. Otherwise, you're going to start thinking you did it. 
And I guarantee you, whenever you're off, and I, when I was off in these foreign countries, I knew good and well, there's no way I'm doing any of this. No way. Because this cannot happen in just me making something happen. And you need to understand that's the way it is with every aspect of your life. And quickly, I, I, I keep on, I don't know why I'm on all these testimonies tonight. But, but you know, whenever, whenever I came back to the, to the U.S., I moved, I was, God was moving back to, to, to the United States, and I kept saying, Lord, why am I coming back here? Why, why are you sending me back here? Because I, 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 I've got to have purpose with what I do. You know, I, I just can't float around. I know God has purpose. I'm on assignment everywhere I go. So I said, Lord, why am I here? I said, I, am I going to start a church? And Because that's what I've always done. And the Lord says, no, but I'm going to give you one. I thought, okay, well, where is it? Where's, where, where is it? That's my attitude. Where is it? And he said, no, you, you know, cool your jets a little bit. And, and he said, I'm going to give you a gift first. I thought, wonderful. I like gifts from the Lord. And uh, now, let me back up really quickly and run into it. Years ago, the Lord told me, he said, I want you to start putting a little money aside every single month. And I want you to save up enough money to equal one year's salary. I had no idea why. I thought I, I thought maybe I'm going to use it to plant a new church or I'm going to use it to uh, bless somebody. I had no idea why. And I get back to the States. I'm in North Carolina at this point. I get back to the States and the Lord says, here's my gift. I'm going to give you a one-year sabbatical. Now, that one-year sabbatical, if you know what sabbatical is, basically I'm not going to be pastoring anymore. I'm doing something else. And guess what I'm going to live on? That one year's worth of salary that I was saving up. And the Lord said, here's your job description for the next year. 12 months. He says, your job is to chase me. And when you catch me, I'll show you your future. So I said, Lord, am I here to start a church? No, I'm going to give you one, but here's the way you do it. You chase me. And when you catch me, I'll show you your future. And then he said, Poof, and he took off. <laughs> Let me tell you something. God can run fast. And I was chasing him. I was chasing him. And during that, and as I chased him month after month after month after month after month, I had seven churches offered to me all around the country. And I would, I would hear it. I would pray about it. Get on the inside. And God would say, no, that's not it. No, that's not it. I am 11 months and one week into this 12-month gift God gave me. And we only got three weeks left before the end of this sabbatical. And I hadn't caught God yet. He's still running fast. And I finally did say, God... I've got three weeks left. I'm really pressing in. And with that three weeks left, the phone rang, and it was the secretary at Agape Church, my home church, said, when, when, you're, when you're in town next, Pastor Carl wants to speak to you. Bam! I said, that's it. I'm going to go there, and this is what's going to happen. I walked into his office, and he said, Scott, I'm stepping away. I believe God's Pope told me that you're the one who's supposed to be the next pastor. So you know what? I didn't, if, if anybody knows, the, the church world, it's kind of hard to make a pastor give you his church. You know what I'm saying? And you don't do it. You just make sure you're rooted in God. You make sure that you're connected to that root. You make sure that you understand who you are in the room and who he is in the room. You make you sure you understand that, that without him you can't do anything and you're completely connected to the revelation of the kingdom of God and the covenants you have with God and things begin to happen. You show up and things happen. Things are brought to you. Things are pushed away from you because living the life that the Lord gave you should not be as hard as what Christians make it out to be. So, quickly, let's let's move on a little bit, a little bit, uh, a little bit further. So there is we're talking about covenants. So so covenants we are we are we are just like when I tell you before I get there. Let's go. We just mentioned that covenant there in Deuteronomy. Let's go back to to. Um, Let's go ahead and jump back to Genesis chapter 17 really quickly. Genesis 17. Now, I mentioned there that he said, I've given you your prosperity that you may establish my covenant as it is this day. Now, when we read that, typically what we do in uh, our, our churchianity world, what we do is we read the part about the prosperity, but we forget about the part that says to establish the covenant. Because when he says that, he's talking about a specific covenant. There's a specific covenant that God was giving the blessing and the wealth to for a purpose. Let's go here to Genesis chapter 17, and we'll read verse 5 through 8. The scripture says, we all know this part uh, as well, and it says here, Nevertheless, your name shall no more be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made you. 
And you, I'll make you seemingly fruitful, and I'll make you, nations of you, and kings shall come out of you. And I'll establish my covenant between me and you, your seed, after you, and the generations for an everlasting covenant. And I will be a God to you, and you sh and to your seed after you. And I will give you the unto the the land. I'm sorry, unto the uh, and unto your seed after the the land where you are a stranger, the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And of course, we know the verse of scripture from Genesis chapter number twelve that says, "God told Abraham, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you a blessing." So there was a covenant given, a covenant of blessing that was attached to Abraham. This not a coincidence that you and I are called the sons of Abraham. It's not a coincidence we're called the children of Abraham because this idea, what was Abraham's great covenantal blessing, promise, you might say promise? promise? Promise that God gave him. What was it about? He was gonna have, he's gonna have children, right? He's gonna, he's gonna have, he's gonna, he couldn't have babies, he's gonna have a baby. And in this room we have the children of Abraham. There's something about knowing our connection to Abraham in this revelation and what that revelation does, bringing about the blessing, which has to do obviously with great, incredible blessings and wealth and riches, having this connection to Abraham, that when we get to that place with revelation, it changes how we live in prosperity. Once again, without getting too, too deep into this, there is an element of our, our prosperity that, let me see if I can say this in, in a way that makes sense. If we believe that prosperity is a part of the plan of redemption, let's put it in that package and ask this question. Can you do anything to earn your salvation, to go to heaven? Because it's not by works, right? But you still use faith to believe, to appropriate, and then once you have it, salvation is yours, right? That doesn't mean you have a great day every day, but you know that you are saved. And typically, you don't have to wake up in the morning and remind yourself that you are saved. If you do, Prophet Ford will pray for you after the service because you need a lot of help. You, you don't have to wake up every morning and remind yourself you're saved. And you might not, and most people don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, I feel saved today. No, that doesn't happen. But you know you're saved whether you feel anything or not, right? You know you're saying, why? Because you made a decision at one time. It's not by works. It's because of the plan of salvation. It's a part of the redemptive plan of God. You can't do anything to earn your salvation. You believe. You accept it. You understand. You believe, have a revelation in your heart of who Jesus is. You accept him, and now you're saved. And you're going to live that way. Can you do anything to deserve or earn the Holy Ghost? That's a free gift, right? So you can't earn the Holy Ghost. You can't do anything to earn the Holy Ghost. It's just, I believe, Lord, fill me with your spirit. You receive it by faith. You have the revelation. It's for you, and you receive that. Can you do anything to earn righteousness? No. You accept the fact that you have been made righteous because of what Messiah did. You believe it by faith. You accept it in your heart, and you live righteously. Everything in this plan of redemption is faith-based. It's not works-based. But when it comes to prosperity... We say, well, if you don't sow, you don't reap. If you don't give, you don't receive. And although we know that's true in the Scripture, there's an element of being made prosperous in the plan of salvation, in our, in our redemption that's already set. It's almost like we have a, a, a level set for us. You know, the Bible says this, every man's been given the measure of faith, right? But you know that you can also, some people can have a much greater faith than other people, right? Everybody has this level playing field of faith, but you can exercise your faith and grow in faith. Maybe, just maybe, when God, when Jesus said that the Lord became poor, for whose sake? That through his poverty you might be made, then, then redemption from poverty is a part of the plan of redemption. So if you only get redemption elements through faith, then why is prosperity all about works. So there is certainly things we do, you know that you have to pray to receive, right? But the Bible always says he's already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, but you still have to ask for them, right? So there's an element, we, we know we do have to sow to receive, we don't have to give to receive. I teach that every single Sunday, and if you're watching me on a live stream on Sunday, you'll hear me talk about giving and receiving, because we do that. That's a part of how we live our life. But, is it possible 
that that is more of an expression of the root than just an external thing to get something. Is it just, maybe it's a part of how we're supposed to live and automatically it comes back to us. You see, if all these things are part of the plan of salvation, then they're all accessed by faith, but they all also have works. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is going to speak. My confession should be not forced, because i got to say it, but it comes out of my heart as expression. My giving should not be because i got to give, but I just give because it comes out of my salvation experience, and it's who I am. You see, so everything that we are comes out of here. We know we have to confess correctly. We know we have to give correctly. We know we have to pray correctly. We just read you, if you pray the wrong way, you don't receive. We know all those things together, but they should come from a root out of us, that, that is from a place of a well of salvation that's on the inside of us that causes our life to be what God meant for it to be. It, it causes us to walk out the kingdom in a more holistic way than just forcing things out that should be effortlessly flowing out of us. When the opportunity comes to give, I want to give. And guess what? It comes right back to me because that's the way God is. And, and, but sometimes people have to be told you need to be given. Why? Because sometimes the flesh gets stronger than the spirit and sometimes things there's a fight there and God works to fix that. So he gives us his word and tells us, okay, this is how you're supposed to live. You're supposed to give. And as you give, you're going to receive. You're supposed to tithe. And as you tithe, I'll rebuke the devourer. This is the way we do things in a thing called the kingdom. This is the way life is lived in the kingdom. But as far as being redeemed from poverty, it is done. It is done. Now we live it out. Now you know as well as I do, there are people who are born again. They love God. They have been made righteous. But they live like the devil. You're laughing because you know somebody, right? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that hurts you. So, <laughs> so, 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 just because it's happened on the inside does not mean it's expressed itself on the outside yet. So, just because you have been redeemed from poverty on the inside does not mean you walk out your prosperity yet. But walking out prosperity looks like a generous, overflowing life of someone who's always giving tithes, offerings, blessings. Uh, entrepreneurial gifts to people. I mean, it's it's it has a look to it. Do you, you understand? You, do I, am I making sense to you? So so there is something about that that we should continue to explore. I can't get into all of it uh, this evening because I want to get to more of this identification. We have this message in its entirety. Send eight dollars for compact disc or twenty dollars for video to the Reality of the Gospel Ministries Incorporated, PO Box sixteen forty ninety one, Little Rock, Arkansas. 72216. If you would like to become a partner with this ministry, you may do so by joining the Ally 200 Club at $25 a month, or you may become a Truth Ally for $10 or more each month. Send your offerings to the Reality of the Gospel Ministries Incorporated, P.O. Box 164091, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72216. If you continue in God's Word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.